The last video was a fun one. We left out the setup so that we could enjoy the pour in its full glory. But, as promised, we'll be going over the setup in this video. What are you doing shoveling the backyard? I was bored. Figured we don't have enough going on and I haven't been getting enough physical exercise logging, so. <laughs> 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 well, the, uh, the weather's pulling a 180 on us. So the last three weeks we've had high of like 10 degrees, most days in the single digits. Now we're gonna get into the 40s and even the low 50s. So the hope is we're really close to being ready to pour the keel. So if we shovel the snow off, we get a couple days of 40, or we get that day of 50 in rain, it might thaw out enough that we can bury the mold and pull a trigger and do the pour before it gets cold again. Fingers crossed. We got like a week and a half window, it looks like, with two days of rain in there to work around. So we're gonna bust hump and we're gonna try our damnedest to get this done. But we'll see, we won't do anything too risky. I mean, the whole shebang is risky enough, so it really just kind of depends on what the weather does, but we want to be prepped either way. So that's what I'm doing, shoveling. Step one. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. Yeah, we know we could have waited for a more opportune time of the year, but that meant delaying over the winter and with not much progress going on in the build. So our plan was to hold off on the pour if anything seemed like it was gonna go wrong. With that said, we started a fire and we started defrosting where the tank needed to go. With the ground a bit more malleable, we went about leveling it as best we could and laid down five old chimney cinder blocks which would act as a base for the tank. These were then filled with dirt and tamped down. We then wrestled the tank onto the base. In this case, it was a 200 gallon, um, fairly new air compressor tank that we had bought. Nice and heavy and stable. With the tank now on its base, we shifted to finalizing the mold for the rest of the afternoon. We added threaded rods to the top so it added a bit more stability, and the whole thing was painted with leftover paint to provide a slight moisture barrier. Finish it off with a little green. Yeah, well, it's just whatever paint we had kicking around. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. Just trying to keep it a little dry when we put it in the ground. So at least there's some sort of barrier between the damp earth and the bare pine. All right, so it's day two on what we believe is going to be a three-day window for us to possibly get the smelter tank set up and pour the keel. Uh, we had about three days. That'll probably warm up enough to melt all the snow that you see in the background. And we're going to get a couple days of rain, or maybe a day of, day of rain, um, this Friday. So we're trying to get everything set up. And then if it rains on Friday and everything kind of melts off and starts to dry out, we might be pouring um, early next week. So Steve is out at Home Depot getting some fittings for what we need for the smelter tank. we got to get a pipe to fit in here. Um, so what I'm going to do is start taking apart the old mold that's right behind there. We had previously made a ballast keel mold out of cement, thinking that this would be our best shot. But after more research, uh, we had some concerns from some sources claiming that the cement could explode due to instant vaporization of trapped moisture. If that happened and the mold did break and collapse into our molten lead, it would be so much harder to salvage for another attempt. We now needed it out of the way, and we could salvage the iron cage we had welded around it for bracing as well as the plywood sides. While I was on demo duty, Steve worked on opening up the tank and welding on the hinges and a handle for the door. When we initially cut the tank open, there was a bit of leftover crud that needed to be scraped up and vacuumed. But all in all, the tank was in excellent shape. Alright, so it's day three of our push to get the smelter tank set up. You can see it right behind us. Yesterday we managed to get an arm welded onto the back so that we can tip it because our exit points aren't directly underneath the tank. Um, we also opened up the top, you can see that right there. And we got some piping that we'll be threading today. Tomorrow's supposed to rain, everything's supposed to melt, and then we got a couple days of dry weather, um, so we'll see if that'll kind of give us a weather window to pour this keel, which would be really, really cool. So my task for today is going to be to clean out this tank. It's a little dirty inside, but it looks really, really good, really solid, so much better than our first try. Um, so yeah, let's get to that. There was some accumulation on the bottom of the tank, as well as some oxidization. Both were scraped off and vacuumed up. Just a pound or two of lead. The majority of our lead came from several salvaged boat keels, which were cut up into marginal sized pieces with a chainsaw. As we went about loading the tank, we weighed every bit of lead going in and made a tally. First to go in were the shavings we collected while cutting up the keels. 
Our thought was that this would melt the fastest and create a pool which would speed up the melting of the blocks. You'll see how much it weighs. 42.40. The first of the lead is in the bank! <laughs> 9,500 pounds of lead is a sizable amount, and when you're taking it piece by piece and putting it in the tank, it takes a while. We made over 100 trips back and forth to fill it. We had to pack in so much lead that Steve actually had to get into the tank in order to stack all the blocks neatly inside. Otherwise, I don't think we would have managed to fit it all in, and that would have led to another problem. We would have had to find a safe way of adding approximately 50 pound blocks to the tank, which would be half full of molten lead, without splashing or getting any lead anywhere else. 3930? Mm-hmm. With the stacking done, we headed inside the tally upper total. And 6370. 79, 12, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, 82, and if we have just over two in we there, we have like two hundred two thousand three something. None of that's calculated in there. Yeah. So we might just have enough. <laughs> All right. So we just tallied up the lead that we put in the tank, uh, and ooh, and uh, what the college students weighed up for us last time. So we have about eight thousand nine hundred and eighty-three pounds total right now. That's not counting a bucket of shavings and a couple other things that people dropped off. And the so, keel's supposed to be nine thousand plus or minus. So, so we are ah, close. We are close. close. <laughs> but we should be ready to pour on Monday, hopefully. All right. It is Saturday. Uh, we took yesterday off for the storm. As you can see, most of the snow has melted off. Yeah. So this is like what our fourth day on the push for the ballast keel mold. Something like that. Yeah, so we're hoping to get it done on Monday, which is in two days. Yeah, so today we had to dig the hole and bury the mold. Tomorrow I'll kind of finish setting stuff up and split some firewood and hopefully light the fire Monday morning. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so right now, tonight we got to put the mold, in, well today we got to put the mold in the ground, so see about digging a hole there. So that's what we're going to do now. Yeah, fun fun. 9,000 pounds of lead has a lot of force behind it. so that could have effect on the mold. The most common sense and easy way to stabilize that would be to dig a hole and to bury it. Unfortunately for us, a much harder task when done in the winter. So we figured that the rain and the nearly 60 degree day would have uh, gotten rid of all the frost around here, but we were completely wrong with that. Oh, I got rid of a lot of it. <laughs> we got a lot of it, but. So we still have like, what, six inches of frost in there? From here to here, yeah. Yeah. We got to beat through. But surprisingly, it's only over there. <laughs> Like this side of the hole was not. This is where we had the fire. Bad. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, the fire made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be good. We'll get it done. Other than loading up the tank, chopping through the frozen dirt was the most strenuous and time consuming aspect of the setup. We had to dig a hole about 12 feet long, 2 feet wide, and a foot and a half deep. No small task in loose dirt, so I'm sure you can imagine how difficult this was. In the end, we broke down and got creative. Even with a flame waiter though, it was still quite a fight. But we got it done and it was on to the next task. Before putting the mold in the ground, we wanted to add even more support, but also include two very strong points we could use to pull the whole thing out of the ground. We decided to weld over the hole we dug as we were worried about welding in the boathouse. With all the wood shavings, it was probably not a good idea and we didn't want to start a fire in the boathouse. Finally, with the hole dug and the mold fully prepared to be buried, we gathered some sand to line the bottom of our hole and this would allow us to level everything, and it would be easier for us to tamp around rather than frozen dirt. Tamping took some time, and this was the last day of our push, so we focused on the work and not the footage. As I worked on the sand with a lot of help from our roommate Ian, Steve worked on finishing the tank in the mold. Since those pieces are missing, why don't we take a quick walk around to set up with Steve and fill in some of those blanks. All right, we're gonna give you a quick tour of the boathouse after the crazy day yesterday. Show you what a mess it is and kind of walk you through everything. Yeah. So as you can see by the state of the boathouse, it's been a wild few days. We had like a really narrow weather window with a ton of work to do. So uh, we worked really hard and we achieved this huge goal of ours, but we kind of trashed the boathouse in the process. <laughs> I've already cleaned up a lot this morning. It was even worse, but it happens. 
So here we have a 9,500 pound ballast keel for an Akinin grid. And this is a gargantuan monkey off our back. Uh, we've been kind of waiting to get it done and dreading doing it a little bit because it's, you know, it's 100 gallons of molten metal. It's pretty dangerous stuff. Um, and if it went wrong, it would be an insane amount of work to do it all over again and a lot of money to do it all over again. So it was one of those kind of got to get it right the first time type deals. So there's a lot of pressure, but it all worked out. And here's what we're left with. So we've got uh, some roofing flashing here and a bucket of shavings that are left over from when we cut the keels up with the chainsaw. And we saved, I don't know, two, 300 pounds or so of lead out of the tank. And we used that to fill in the lead as it cooled. So basically the outside of it cools first and as the leg cools it shrinks. So when the outside solidifies it becomes hard and if the top does the same thing, there's no place for that lead to draw from as it cools and you end up with voids inside. So we kept a couple holes open across the top of the mold as things cooled and as that lead level dropped because everything shrank, we would add in some of the stuff to, uh, to bring that level back up and it worked really well. So you take these chunks of flashing here and just take the hammer and whack them and just fold them over so that we ended up with like a tube. And then we could just plop those into the holes. And then once the holes closed up enough and were cool enough that they couldn't really accept the plate anymore, we switched over to all the shavings. And we would just throw a big handful at the top of each hole and use the flame weeder to melt them in to keep the lead levels up so we didn't end up with any voids or huge divots. So you can see our four craters that we added the lead to. So we kind of let the top solidify a little bit and then melted out those four holes and kept adding the lead. And you can see that as things cool, they dropped even lower. So we'll have to melt up some lead and top them up a little bit, but that's not a big deal. And the mold held up really well. You can see we ripped out some of the crossbars because we kept setting them on fire with the flame weeder. And same thing where the big burns are in the side of the mold, that's not actually really from the lead, that's from us with the flame weeder trying to keep the top a bit molten. The only real big snafu we had with the mold was we had put a plywood liner inside and some parts of it came up. So it seems like the parts from the bottom, I don't know if it's because they're pretty narrow, this is the whole width of it. And then some parts of the corner molding came up as well. So it seems like the corner molding broke off and then this thin plywood in the bottom curled and broke. So we had, I don't know, a few pieces this size come up um, and a bunch of the corner molding. So not really the end of the world. Uh, it makes the keel in those sections a half an inch bigger than it has to be. And we'll probably have to fare that out with a power planer. Um, but really, all in all, minor, minor issue. So now that we've seen the final product, uh, let's go over and check out a little bit of the process getting there. So here's our outlet pipe. And that's just connected to the piping at the bottom. So lead melts and it flows out through here. So by keeping it upright, we can just let the molten lead kind of fill up into the pipe. And then when we're ready to do the pour, we can just lower this. So right now it's hooked up to the back of the Subaru, which is how we had it for the pour. And we set it up so that we just pull a pin and then we could hang onto the chain and lower it. And then somebody could stand in the boathouse and pull on this chain. It goes down through the big clevis. And then that would direct this spout down to where it needed to go. And that worked really well. We had no issues. It went really smoothly. And then when the pour was done, we got a couple people on the chain and we pulled the pipe back up, locked it back off, and then it was up and out of the way for us to work on the mold. One issue we did have in the morning is we hooked the Subaru up to it. We wanted to use the tractor, but it wouldn't start this morning. So we hooked the Subaru up and I pulled a little too hard when I was taking the tension out of the chain and I broke one of the pipe fittings down here. So that was a really rocky start. We, uh... <laughs> At like 7:30 in the morning had to run to the hardware store and go get new pipe fittings and tear that apart but thankfully it broke in a really convenient spot to repair and it was a pretty quick and cheap fix but lesson learned <laughs> not that we're probably ever going to do it again 
So for our tank, we use an old air compressor tank, actually a pretty new air compressor tank. The top of the air compressor tank had a huge bracket welded on it where the motors lived, uh, which for us flipped the other way, it made a really great foundation for the tank. And the other thing by flipping it is any moisture or anything that would have collected in the tank and corroded it would have been on the bottom. So by flipping it, we put that up at the top where it's really a non-issue. And we kept the nice clean top of the tank as our bottom where the lead would sit. It also gave us two three-quarter inch outlets that were factory put in the tank and we could use those to plumb together for our outlet. So that's what we did down here. And there was one little tricky bit about that plumbing and that was that the two outlets are fixed and maybe there's a way that we're not aware of but we couldn't figure out how to get all the fittings to screw together and everything be tight because to tighten one you loosen the other. So what we ended up doing is just picking one point that we thought we would easily be able to weld and deal with. And we went over and we had the pipe threaders that we picked up in anticipation of threading the keel bolts and the other fasteners for the backbone. And we were lucky enough that we had the correct size die. So we threaded down the pipe farther than it needed to be, threaded the fitting really deep on, and then when we wound it into the next fitting, we kind of like unscrewed it halfway, but we still had a bunch of threads in there. But they were loose because it's a tapered threading on the pipe fittings. So I did the most careful welding job of my life and went around those threads and put on like six layers of weld and made sure that there were still the threads there, but that it was all sealed up. And it worked because that didn't leak. So the two outlets, there's one here and one on the other end, and they're fixed. And to connect the piping between them, we couldn't figure out a way, because anytime you wanted to tighten one, you inadvertently loosened another. Um, and there was no way, I, we could have put a longer nipple on here, I guess, and then maybe tighten the nipples last, but we wanted these as tight to the tank as we could. Um, so our solution was we took the pipe threaders that we had gotten for doing the uh, keel bolts and the other backbone timbers later and we threaded this pipe much farther down than it was originally and then we threaded this fitting really deep on and then attached it here so that when we tightened it at the other end this fitting although it loosened a lot it still had th a thread connection and then I went and very, very, very carefully welded all the way around it and then just kept adding beads of weld and beads of weld and beads of weld until I was pretty confident that the lead wasn't going to be able to find a way out of this joint. And we still had the thread connection, but it wouldn't be, you know, totally lead tight. And it worked really well. We had super minor leakage from up here and down here somewhere, but it was like two tiny little dribbles and stopped. It was actually kind of good because it showed us that we had liquid lead in the system, um, but it wasn't enough to, to cause any issues. So I'll show you the foundation setup we had for the tank here. So I'll take this heat shield off that we had welded on there. In the very bottom, we have some uh, square blocks that used to be a chimney on the house back in the day. And those were just slightly wider than the bracket that the motors used to sit on. So that was pretty perfect. We leveled the ground, lined five of them up, packed them full of dirt, took some heavy angle iron and welded a cage around the top of them so that the blocks couldn't go anywhere. And then that worked out pretty perfectly that when we put the tank on it, it rode on those steel rails um, on that angle iron. So it wasn't even sitting on the concrete, it was sitting on the steel that was spread out across the concrete. So we felt really good about that foundation. We put on a couple outrigger arms um, just because it is a narrow base so that if it did start to tip, it would have at least some resistance. And then one of our really big concerns and an issue we had with our first rendition of our smelter tank setup was that the fire got too hot and it weakened the steel legs and they just kind of turned to spaghetti and that's really not good. And this time we have way more weight than we had before. So we needed to find a solution and our solution was just to isolate it. So we put the bracket that the motors used to sit on down on the bottom and then we just welded in this scrap steel plate around it. And the idea is that one, it's low in the fire and heat rises. So you can actually put your hand on like the bottom of a wood stove and it's much cooler down there than it is on the top. 
same kind of theory. So hopefully these plates just would direct the heat up to the side of the tank. And by having all of this open and by having the air gap between the heat shield and the tank, that air would kind of just be an insulator and a cushion and wouldn't conduct enough heat to really mess with these legs. And it seems like it worked. I mean, they're perfectly straight and they haven't sagged into the tank. They don't seem to have deformed at all. Um, so it seems like those heat shields worked really well. On the front of the tank, we tack welded them to the tank so that when we tipped it, they would go with it. And on the sides and in the back, we tack welded them to the frame down below so that they wouldn't be in the way when we tipped it. And we just tack welded it. So if for some reason they gave us a problem when it came time to tip, a quick blow with a sledgehammer and we would have them out of the way. Um, as proof by me ripping this one off this morning. So this is our pretty ugly lifting mechanism made out of the scrap tube steel that we had from cutting our old tank supports apart. And this worked really well. Um, we have hinges welded on the front side and we just pick it up. And right now it's hooked to the Subaru so it's stopping us. But you can lift that all the way up to about chest height and drain all the lead out. And when we started loading the tank, we put, I don't know, a half a ton, maybe a ton of lead in the bottom of the tank, and one of us could lift this. So we were quite confident that once the liquid level got down to that line, it would be easy enough to pick this up and put some blocking underneath it and keep going until all the lead was out and worked beautifully. So you'll notice that we have a bunch of pieces of steel laying around. And this is actually part from our old smelter tank that we then turned into a steam box or the steam generator, and this is the leftover from that. So we just kind of flattened it out, and we put that, it was tighter when we were actually burning around the mold. And then same thing with the part of the oil drum there on that side, and the steel for the fire reflectors came from that tank. And then we had those old panels of sheet metal roofing in the back that we kind of propped up on the tops. And the idea with that was to just keep the fire as close and as concentrated to the tank as possible. And since we couldn't apply any heat to the bottom of the tank because we effectively had that blocked off, we really needed to focus the heat on the sides of the tank. And having those reflectors made a big difference. And because these were such heavy steel, we were actually able to just stack the wood almost Lincoln Log style from the ground all the way up to the height of this and just had a towering inferno that encircled the entire tank. Um, yeah, and it worked really well. It took, I don't know, what, like four hours maybe? Three hours, something like that, to melt almost 10,000 pounds of lead. It's a lot of BTUs. We went through, I don't know, maybe a quarter firewood? Definitely at least half a cord. But thankfully we have lots of firewood. So another thing we learned with doing the other pour was it was kind of a pain to open and close the tank to see what was going on in there. So we set up a, a permanent way to do that. And it worked really well. Just walk out to the side and set it down and you could actually walk out on the uh, lifting arm and get decently close to the tank and be able to see in there and poke in there. And then it was a simple matter of closing it back up. So that was pretty handy. Should we take a look inside and see what's left? Okay, so here's one of the bronze keel bolts that we dug out of the tank. So when we chainsawed up the lead keels, we just left the keel bolts in there and figured that they would be way too big to clog the drains and we would just fish them out at the end. And that works, so there's one, and if you look in the tank, you can see a few more. There's some that are steel. There's also a couple blocks that we thought were lead, and apparently we're wrong, because they didn't melt. Like whatever this one is. Kirk. So, some other metal. So thanks for watching, and if you haven't seen the video of us doing the pour yet, check it out. It's pretty ridiculous. 
And uh, tune in next time and we'll show you what this thing looks like out of the mole in the ground. It takes us quite a while to dig it up and get it moved, but we'll show you how we get that done soon.